Hi, everyone. This is Paul Casey, the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame educational video series, where we talk about Kempo principles, concepts, uh, forms, techniques, the history of Kempo. And sometimes we are very fortunate to have a special guest with us. Uh, this next gentleman I've known for almost 41 years. 41 years. He still looks the same to me. Awesome kind of guy. He's one of the leading Kempo practitioners with Mr. Uh, Parker in Pasadena from 79 to Mr. Parker's untimely death in 1990. He assisted in so many facets of uh, Parker's uh, development of the new Kempo procedures and books and insightfulness. And he went on uh, seminars with them. He's just a wonderful, good person. And he's also one of the most knowledgeable. So would you please give a warm welcome to my friend and ours, Senior Master of the Arts, Lee Wedlake. Hello, Lee. How are you? Good to see you, Paul. Thanks yes, for having sir. me. Yes, sir. It is always good to see you. What that smile, folks. Million dollar smile. <laughs> He's living large there in Texas, getting a tan outside. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're excited to have him on here. I'm lucky because he comes on here occasionally and he brings a whole new perspective into Kempo. Uh, Mr. Parker wanted our system be a thinking man system, not to waste our time with just how to do something. He wanted it broken down and so you can understand it. But I'm gonna let Mr. Wedlake tell us more about it. Uh, Lee has written 12 books, 12. He's an author. That's really important because that is something that will stay with us for the remainder of Kempo. Uh, long after I'm gone or Mr. Wedlake's gone, that will still be there a reference and these are a chance for you to listen to him say things about it. He had two previous uh, books. I was really, I own one of them. I love it. And I'm going to have Lee talk about them. So Lee, why don't you give us an insight into what is currently available and how they can get those books? The uh, latest one was, re was released on Amazon on September 6th. And that uh, I have a proof copy of that. It's uh, Lee Wedlake's Kempo Companion. It's almost 500 pages. Uh, the previous one was released in 2017. It was uh, the Kempo Karate Compendium. And the two books are significantly different. Uh, the rest of my books that I had uh, written and published years ago are no longer available. Uh, Kempo 101 through 601. Um, actually, 101 stood by itself. There was a book called Further Insights in the Kempo. And... 201 through 601 were compiled and made into a compendium to produce the compendium in 2017. So uh, that one um, came out with uh, significant editing and pictures reshot and so on. The other book that I had written was called Lessons with Ed Parker, which I wrote to kind of get people more of a sense of what he was like as a man. Yeah as a human being, what he was thinking, not just, uh, well, how he was thinking, not just what he was thinking, but that's out of print as well. So we're down to, uh, besides the three fiction books that I've written with the Kempo Black Belt, Phil Buck in England, uh, we're down to the compendium and the companion being available on Amazon. And uh, can they also acquire, is it always strictly through Amazon or can they go to your website or? Uh, at this time, I don't even have any books. Uh, I ordered some from Amazon and I'm still waiting. Everybody else had ordered theirs once the release was made. They've been getting them in the mail. I'm still waiting. Oh, okay. But, now, um, you're you still. Can to, you can go to Blue Snake Books to get the compendium. Okay. Uh, subsidiary of Random House. So uh, you can order from them if Amazon doesn't make you happy. You know, at the end of this uh, conversation later on, I'll be able to try to put those links at the bottom underneath um, the video so that you can, uh, those that are watching this can actually uh, look this up. But Amazon is the key. Go to Amazon and uh, that will uh, be your best source for receiving that. Is there any other things that you're working on besides the books? Uh, well, you know, I've always got my uh, video platform on Vimeo. Uh, I've got the two tiers, one for beginners and intermediates, another one for uh, advanced and instructors. And uh, you just go to Vimeo and look for my name. Uh, it's a subscription basis, but there's about 1,600 videos between the two tiers. 1,600, wow. 
Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the basics, the forms, the self-defense techniques, uh, I, you know, the principles, terminology, uh, seminar clips, uh, the whole deal are, are posted on those. And each one's got uh, about 50 freebies that you can watch. Uh, and I built playlists to go along with those. I've, uh, I'm included in a book that's coming out here very, very shortly called There I Was When Nothing Happened. By oh, Jason Brick. Okay. Jason, <laughs> what a great title. Uh, Jason's a Kempo man, and um, he asked me to be part of this, along with several other experts in the security field, which, uh, and the focus of the book is on de-escalation, because uh, people tend to focus on, well, this happened, and then a fight happened, and what did you do to him, and all that. Well, uh, this is like what happened, and what was the thought process the mechanics of de-escalating this thing so nobody gets hurt. So uh, that's going to be out very, very shortly as well. It's just so appropriate you said that because in this in these times right now, there is such a, an agitated mindset of our communities. Oh. There's there's no enforcement of laws. There's no respect for one another. Uh, it's it's so contrary to American beliefs and principles. Yeah, I, I deal with it every day in my job as a security officer at the Alamo. Uh, there's a lot of mental health issues and so on that people are becoming aware of, but that's another subject. Absolutely. And, you know, funny is that we talk, you were talking about these, uh, these studies. Do you find that most people are interested just in how to do rather than why they should? Uh, that seems to be the majority, but as you know, uh, as you progress through the arts, and I think almost any art when it's properly taught, will get you past that hump and get you thinking about uh, not just how you're doing it, but why you're doing it. And that happens at different levels in different arts. Uh, and of course, the individual, if they stick around with it, they should be able to achieve that. But a lot of people... Uh, don't continue. They get frustrated. They want to sit on the couch instead. They want the uh, the stuff uh, poured into their head without having to work on it. And uh, there's a pride of ownership thing. It's like, look at all this cool stuff I can do. Uh, and they just don't go past that to get into the, the whys and so on. I read on one of, in one of your books about the advocating that of the study of the web of knowledge. Yes. You're big on that. And and you were there when uh, the restructuring of the Ed Parker 32 techniques moving forward. You want to just rest that a little bit? Um, you know, I talk about it in this new book. <clears throat> and the new book is significantly different than uh, the compendium because the compendium has got to focus on the forms. And this book, of course, when you write something, someone says, well, aren't you going to do something about the self-defense techniques? And as we know, with uh, all those self-defense techniques, even Ed Parker didn't decide to put all of them in a book because they can get, uh, there's just a lot of material and it's, it's expensive. I think uh, the vehicle for that is video, but you can talk about the aspects of the self-defense techniques, which is what I do in this. And it's more like, if you're looking at these lists, how do you cross index? between the techniques and the belt levels and then there's context about when you learn something because you know there's people who like to say well there's no such thing as a black belt technique and there really isn't because you can take some more complex uh, material and teach it to beginners if you do it right and they can do it they may not be as smooth or as crisp as powerful as black belts but you can see them do uh, techniques that have multiple movements in them so Working with all of this, it's uh, it really depends on how you're taught. Uh, to pick it up and move forward. But uh, somebody sticks around long enough, I think they get the idea like there's something more to this, and your instructor should be uh, savvy enough to uh, guide them. What was the most challenging thing Ed Parker presented to you in your in your time with him in those beginning before we came out with Infinite Insights? Uh. By the way, Infinite Insights, for those of you that are not aware of, or the, was a five-book series written by Ed Parker, and it was broken down uh, into different areas that he wanted to talk about. Uh, but uh, Lee was actually one of the 
the individuals that was involved with that, as long as with other two other people or three other people. So go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I wanted well, to. I, you know, I had studied, uh, I'm going to call them variations of Kempo prior until I got with uh, directly with Ed Parker. And I was just so fortunate to have that opportunity that uh, when I got with him and he introduced me to the thinking, the concepts, the principles, the terminology, I mean, that was a challenge because it wasn't just put your hand like this or this goes like this. And, uh, making you think about uh, what's going on and why was the challenge. Did you have any involvement in the actual structures of the Infinite Insights or was that before he had pretty much written it or did you help break that down or how did that work? Uh, you know, that's an interesting question because um, we used to talk quite a bit and um, at one point in time, he had actually handed me the manuscript for uh, what I think was um, volume two or three. He said, take this back to your uh, hotel room, look it over, see what you think. And when I came back the next day, I, I had been up most of the night reading this and I gave it back to him and he says, well, did you make any corrections? <laughs> make corrections in Ed Parker's work? I was like, uh, no, but I have questions. And uh, when we started to talk about these things, I said, well, there's, what about this? And he said, yeah, and if you, if you do that, then you can do this. So the process that he had in place to working with his black belts was exactly that because we would ask questions and he said that the information that he would put in, like he said, the books would become more pregnant with information because you get that feedback and things you don't think of, you know, the next guy asks and then that gets added into the pot. So I saw the things that we talked about become part of those books. Yeah, it's funny because we take it for granted today. We can ask questions of our instructors and, and <laughs> challenge them. This is 30, we're talking 32 years ago. Right. Parker passed. Well, let's back it up, folks. We're talking 42 years ago yeah. when Lee was beginning his journey with Ed Parker, actually three years ago. But, um, and I was just a puppy in there. I'd gone from uh, one of these at first generation black belts to Pasadena and I never left that. And it was just a whole different mindset. But then again, you're dealing with a very intelligent man who had structured education. Yes. So it, this was passed on to you. That's why your writings are so articulate and, and, and they're refined in the sense that they lay it out, but they're not so uh, absolute that it doesn't give the reader a chance to explore and i think that's one of the comments that i think is really important we'll get to it later um in the end of your your newest book the companion dr hawkins wrote the the end and it was wonderful i i want to say because he gave such an insight into your writing style which made it so personal and folks that's the best part about when you sit and you listen to uh, Senior Master of the Arts, Lee Wedling, he makes it feel personal, like it's yours with him. And he's going down that path with you, but he's not holding your hand, but he's making sure you don't fall. Yeah. And, <laughs> and that's really important. I know. And the, here's the beauty. They can come back to this book and again and again and again. And so that, so again, you're one of the architects behind the scenes with Ed Parker. And remember, we, for those that didn't know, Ed Parker was a one-man operation, basically. Yeah. I mean, he uh he had a lot on the plate besides having a family he had to run a business and he had, which included not only his instructors his seminars but he had time to do his books as an author but he also had the international karate championships and so he was in high demand and uh, i think those are one of the important things one of the reasons i bring this up is one of the coolest books, if you get a chance, and I hope this is still available. It's Lessons with Ed Parker, okay? Yeah, not He's available there. anymore. This Now, this is gold, so you can't have mine. I'm right just telling you right now. You can't have mine. But if you can find this, you get an insight into Lee Wedlake's relationship with the founding Grandmaster. That was an important thing. And um, 
I've read this. I've gone through it. There's, I have earmark stuff in here. Sorry about that, Lee. You wrote on it too for me, but dang, I've got marks in here of things I think are great, the stories. There's wonderful photographs documenting your relationship with uh, Mr. Parker. And I think the greatest thing about it, you'll find out about, about Lee is when we get to the end here, some things that there's a quote I have from Ed Parker that defines Lee. So let us talk about Mr. Wedlake. Let's go and talk about the uh, this new book. Or do you want to do a, co a contrast comparison and contrast with the you, you sort of did, but you want this want to stay with this one, the new one? Let's stay with the new one, yeah. Okay, because it's the newest out. So let's go with you on this. So your book breaks it down and it has some really interesting way you've laid it out. Okay. And if I can, I'm gonna sit, I'm gonna try to see if I can uh, make this happen here. Uh, you talked the first chapter. You, it's basically an overview of your relationship with the student. Yes. And why don't you explain? Let's just walk through the chapters without just just superficially to give a little bit so that each chapter can be represented here. And that's where you're going to really learn something, folks, when you listen to what Lee has to say. Well, I wanted to write that first uh, chapter because I think it's my experience seems to be a lot like uh, many people's experiences that you get good instructors and you get bad instructors. And hopefully you go into a studio and you've got a good one that can take you from white to black or wherever it is that you want to go. Uh, but the it seems to be that a lot of us go from instructor to instructor because of different um, things that happen in our lives. And uh, a non-karate person bought this new book recently. And I had told her, I said, I don't think it's going to make a whole lot of sense to you. She goes, well, you know, I read the first chapters because I cannot believe the things that you went through and you stuck with it. And I think that's the important lesson that's in that first section. Um, Heather Botsford, who was a, a writing instructor at Southeast uh, Louisiana University, helped me with the layout. And she said, I'm really big on introductions uh, in, in books. She goes, but you're your introduction. So telling your story really sets up the tone for the rest of the book. Yeah, if anybody were to read any of the history of uh, Lee Wedlake, there was no question of his focus and, and his commitment to Kempo and what he did. And, you know, I remember when you walked into Pasadena, uh, that was sometime in this, I remember it was like in the first part of the first quarter of 79. Was am I right? Something like that? Uh, yes. Yeah, and you walked in, and I and I saw you, and you, you just come in. I think you came in from Chicago or something like that. Um, I know you've been in different states, so but um, <laughs> I had I had the best job, which was sitting there watching greatness walk in the room. And I asked Frank. I said, "Here's he's just just him." I walked in, and oh yeah, he's gonna be trained with Ed Parker. He's out of you know the Midwest. Blah blah blah. And I think. That's when she says introduction, and I'm, I'm just telling the truth here. This guy's a good guy. He wouldn't have been here this long, but for that commitment. If he's that committed to making sure that Kempo is, is protected and grows and whatnot and tries to keep up that message that Ed Parker wants, what do you think he's going to do for you? He's yeah. hopefully going to be that individual that can uh, help you. I I think the greatest gift is to have, to have the... Um, to live a life to inspire others to personal greatness. And I think that's what you represent all the way. That's what I try. That's one, that's part of my motivation. I want people so, to get what they want. There's a few, uh, in chapter one, you have, uh, you know, these are some of the headings in here. So I'm just going to gloss over them and then we'll jump on a few maybe. Uh, what's my instructor thinking? An interesting contradiction. Built-in frustration. <laughs> I guess that one. <laughs> Check your form. Oh, my, there's a few people that should be checking their form no matter what. Uh, sometimes you're a piece of meat. That I can attribute to. I remember that. But, you know, we never really got hurt in camp. Well, it looks like we were getting killed, but that's yeah, – but there's probably more to that than that. Um, sure. The Iron Monkey, and then these other things that came up that I thought were really cool. The, uh, the Three Faults, Cross Training, Lefties, and the Belt Pledges in Kempo Creed. And I'm just going to ask you – uh, about, I'm going to ask you about the common one. The three faults you're going to have to find out for yourself, folks. But the belt pledges and Kempo Creed, why don't you have, tell us just a little bit on that? Well, I, I just wanted to touch on them because uh, 
I don't think a lot of schools use them. And I think that when you're, if you are using them and you're reciting these things, you need to look at the words. I really, as an author, you need to break the words down and find out what they really mean. And if that is something that you believe in, that you subscribe to. And uh, when I, I write in the book there, it says, well, there's a couple of words in there. It's like, I don't know about that, but coming from Ed Parker's mind, I can see why he wrote them like that. So what was the a, inspiration for Ed Parker? I, I know it's a trick question, but I, uh, the inspiration for Ed Parker His pledges. Yeah. Oh boy. Well, you know, he had to build an organization and he, and the uh, loyalty is a two way street, but I think this is one of the tools that you would use to help build a loyalty and say, this is what I expect from you. And it's in print. Mm -hmm. You have to, you believe any of that attributes to his faith in God? Oh yes. See, I want to, I'm going to just touch on that. For most of you, uh, Ed Parker came from the Mormon faith and uh, BYU was his school of graduation. Being that he was in Hawaii, and if you've been to Hawaii, it's heavy Mormon uh, influence there. And then he went to Salt Lake City, where he, uh, and I'm really happy to say that I was lucky enough to read the Constitution, which was created up there, 62, which lays it out, but it was restructured. Um, those pledges, there's a purpose for each pledge. Am I right? Absolutely. Okay. What about the ple the pledges? Or is it is it is it the proper term for pledges and the degrees of black belt? Or is that just an overview? Because I've seen that with Dennis Knasser. He has his 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 pledge um chart. Have you seen that? I believe I have, but it's been a while. Okay. He he lays it all the way up to 10th degree black belt. Yeah. So uh you know, I think there is a a heavy burden that comes on with there's to borrow a line with rank comes great responsibility. Oh yeah. Sort of a play on something that was used by Stan Lee. But point is, and he's not related to Bruce. So for those of you that are out there, uh, <laughs> the point is, is that it is, there's a burden when you realize that the art that's given to you or shared with you, not given to you, you shared, you have to earn it. Um, it is your responsibility to protect it and help guide the next generation. Would you agree? I, I agree with that. Um, you know, this all starts from day one when you learn how to bow. And if you do a sloppy bow, like Eddie Downey from Ireland likes to say, so if, if you can't even salute properly, why should I teach you an art that can um, hurt or kill somebody? You have to get control of yourself and learning how to bow properly is part of that. Is there a misconception of the proper bow? A misconception? Well, I mean, people, uh, you know, there's an Asian or uh, an Eastern bow and there's a Western bow. And I think that sometimes people take the bows like, well, I'm, I'm being subservient. And I've always taught it as it's a two-way street. We're bowing to each other. Without uh, students, there are no teachers, but we have to respect one another when we do this. So, um, you know, Mr. Parker said there was a difference between a bow and a, and a salutation. Correct. So, and these are things you can learn through your books, correct? Yes, there's okay. uh, there's a lot of material in there about that. I, I, I want to share. I know that in uh, his Infinite Insights, he shows the full salutation. Mm -hmm. However... We know also that Mr. Parker had some health issues with his legs, okay? I remember one time he had gout and he was very yes, upset, right. and, you know, and whatnot. Um, so he stood a little more erect in the latter part of his life, you know, but that's that's one of the examples that I would say, you need to go back to the way it was with originally, with the, the, the knees bent and the proper stances. When you're in a horse stance, you're right. like sitting on a horse, not standing like you're up in the stirrups okay folks right, right i mean those are things that frank slammed into my head i'm talking about frank trejo for those of you that don't know who that is so let's go on and 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 talk about the next thing which i have here put it on the glasses so i can read chapter two so in chapter one we had the student side that you know it's funny you're, it's sort of like the point of view discussion which right I love, but I, I love how you incorporate that for those that know what that means. You'll find 
you'll you'll smile. If those of you don't, well, you need to pick up one of Lee's books and he'll give you an insight into that, why it's important from the point of view. The second one, you're looking at chapter two, the instructor side on teaching and testing. Teaching and testing. What's the distinction between the two there, Mr. Wedlake? Are they not the same? You've got to give the same? You've got to give the instruction. You can teach somebody, but not necessarily evaluate or, or critique them. And so you've got to, uh, you know, in most disciplines, you're going to have to take a test and see what comes out. It puts a little bit of pressure on you. And uh, you get the evaluation and you get the critiques and you get the pass or the fail. Hmm. You've had it here. One of the things that I really like, but this comes also from your background and your experience in life as a law enforcement agent, um, you know, and other things that you have done, uh, especially even in the martial arts almost all your whole life. I mean, there's a lot of background. If you really go past before Ed Parker, before EP, so to speak, there's a lot there with Mr. Wedlake. The, one of the key things that you say right off the bat, which is interesting because you said that in the first one, what you reference in chapter one, what's my instructor thinking? Mm -hmm. That's student. And then you go to chapter two, the instructor said, am I being a professional? Yeah. So you have the, you have two people thinking at the same time is, what is he thinking about? And the other guy saying, am I really being professional? Am I being a jerk? Which I think we see that more often. Lack of professionalism is a lack of prepper, uh, pre being prepared to teach this student, correct? Uh, well, yeah, there's um, presence. How do you look? And then there's the, you know, I break it down in there. It's like, what is, what does professional mean? What does profess mean? Where did it come from? And there's a little history lesson in there. And uh, the components that it takes for what an instructor is supposed to be as far as uh, a presence, and um, then transmitting the information. Yeah, I think I think your whole uh, demeanor, the way you carry yourself, your you see your presence, your, your the way you walk in, the way you're you're uh, you're dressed, That's right. all lead to things that you have here, like integrity, leadership. These are things, uh, you know. Interesting. I liked how you went past the. the we are never been a traditional art at all. It's, it's always been something that has evolved way past it earlier of asking questions to the instructor, which normally is never permitted. Right. I mean, that just is. And I think that's because it's a psychological tool used in traditional arts so that they can control the student from day one, a mindset formulated rather than allowing them to create. But um there's a couple of questions in here, which is interesting. What uh, you, you brought it up in here, but I'm not going to address it. I'm going to ask you, what's the biggest problem that most instructors deal with with their students? The number one thing that Parker always alluded to is the secrets of Kempo Karate. Yeah, there's no secrets. That's that anybody will tell you that's been around for a while. It's just, there may be things that haven't been taught yet, okay, but the secret is hard work yes and the thing is that a lot of people don't want to do the hard work they want this the easy way it's like you, so you bring it up is don't teach the basics hello yeah i you know i i was in pasadena one night and i've said this story parker watched me then he walked out of the office and wearing his khakis and his hawaiian shirt kicked off the flip-flops he said i'm going to take over your class and he said, I'm going to teach your students here the secrets of Kempo Karate. Yeah. And for about 25 minutes, all he did was the basics. That's until right. Until they dying, mm -hmm. you know, perspiring because conditioning, well, you know, the ELSA takes over, you know, when talent <laughs> runs out. Right. right. Better run faster than the other dude, you know? So it's interesting how you make that a part. So, that's in part two, chapter two. So we've looked at one and two now. And it's nice seeing how you also broke it down into two other facets. These are, by the way, 
if you expect me to tell you everything, folks, or you think Mr. Wedley is going to tell you the answers right now, you're uh, <laughs> sorely misunderstanding what our um, <laughs> That's not going to happen. And even if he did tell you, it wouldn't help you. That's where this is not the cliff notes. You got to really get in here and read this. And, and got to get in and read it. Yeah, it's there. You break it down even teaching police and teaching women. You know, what's the hardest issue you find with, with those two types of groups? Well, um, they're, they're significantly different. And, uh, I, you know, I make those points in the chapters there, but uh, a lot of police officers are, you know, they're pretty cliquish. And several of them, you know, lots of them like to say, well, I've got a, I've got a weapon or weapons. And sometimes you can't use those or you shouldn't use those. Um, they've got uh, restrictions. Like you'd say, well, you're going to do this. You're going to poke him in the eyes. You're going to break his arms. A police officer can't do that. And uh, I mean, they can, but it's going to be bad. Uh, Teaching women is a whole different thing because four, you know, three out of four women have had some sort of physical altercation in their lives. And uh, I, I had learned that just a long time ago. And it turned out as I talked to women for years and years of teaching, it seems to be very true. And some of it is perception. Like, I don't know, I wasn't there, but she perceived it as a threat. And uh, it, made an indelible stamp in her mind. So you're up against that as well. And when you're teaching women, sometimes you say, well, you know, we're gonna do a defense against a choke and you go to put the hands on and they break into tears. Something happened and you have to be yeah, prepared for that as an instructor. It could have been something, I hate to say it, you know, in this world we live in, there's a lot of sick people. Yeah. Do a lot of sick things. Right. It's come from abusive families and it becomes second nature. You Absolutely. can abuse people. And uh, that's not the we're supposed to be. Well, um, you need to be a, aware of those factors when you're teaching. Uh, just We just need to know about it. Do you use uh, any of the A, uh, Mr. Parker's Infinite Insights, the eight considerations? Do you Absolutely. Reference those? Yes, yeah, I hope that people see that, you know. <laughs> uh, I mean, Lord have mercy, I you know, it's, there's a false sense of security. I, I think when I first went into the school, I thought, oh, he taught me how to do this move. Oh, wow. I, I, somebody grabs me. I'm going to be able to do this. And, I'm, and what did you do? You ran home and said, my brother, go, grab me. Do this. I'm going to show you something. <laughs> he goes, I could have grabbed you. What the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> well, I've got this. And then, sadly, um, I found out uh, that's not real life. <laughs> You've yeah. got to learn. There's a lot more to this stuff. So yeah. it's... Uh, it's interesting. I asked you about writing earlier. And in chapter three, you talk about Mr. Parker, okay? And there is a one uh, one part in there you talk about writing for Ed Parker. Without breaking that part down too much, what was the biggest challenge writing for Ed Parker? Well, you're writing for uh, something to give to someone who is the founder of the system. And uh, it's, it's like giving your math homework to Einstein. So he looks at it and, you know, he would look at things and say, well, you got the, you know, got the skeleton of the idea, but you're missing some bones. Uh, which was good for me because I could learn what, which bones were missing and fill in the picture. So I may not have ever written a formal thesis for him, but I wrote a lot of magazine articles and I, they always went to him first for him to read and okay uh, on the various aspects of Kempo. <clears throat> and uh, so it was, it was a little scary. And sometimes, you know, I would just write and say, okay, well, if he doesn't like it, he doesn't like it, but I'm going to learn something about it. Do you find it was really more of a test for you to be a better student rather than, or was it he was also being the student? I, you know, I think he was also, you know, maybe not a student, but he would look at it and say, what is this perspective and how many other people have that same perspective? And it's one of the things that he told me, he says, I love to talk to you because you ask me things nobody else asks. And uh, so he would read these and go, hmm, okay, where did that come from? So I think it was a learning experience for him too. With you, did, is it in the book, what was the most challenging thing he asked you or the one that confused you the most or the most rewarding response he gave you for your writing? 
Well, I think the rewarding response was not necessarily like, hey, you did a great job. It's just he asked me to help him out with some of these projects. He asked me to write the foreword or, you know, preface to his books, you know, and he um, would confer with me about things. So I think that's the reward for that sort of thing. Uh, uh, do you remember uh, what was the most disappointing thing that you had? Was there ever a failure on your part? A failure on my part. In my your mind. own war, on your own mind, not in his, but maybe in your like, gosh, I should have done a little better on this. I wrote something. I didn't, it did, wasn't turn out the way I wanted it. Did you uh, put you your foot in your mouth is what I'm basically saying. And you went, oh crap, remove that quickly. No, not really. Uh, there were things that I had started to put together and, uh, never finish them because I didn't, just didn't think they were good enough. And being the age that I was at the time, I didn't necessarily know the right questions to ask. And my focus was different. Uh, somebody asked me the other day, it's like, what about the spiritual aspects of Kempo? And I said, well, when I was working with him, I wasn't, that was not my interest. I didn't ask a lot about that. So that just didn't make it into my experience very much. Hmm. Okay. Did you ever, did he ever ask you to rewrite something for him? And then he adopted it for his, in his books? Uh, no, not directly. There wasn't anything that I could say, well, you know, I did that. Um, some of the things that he had uh, looked at that turned into magazine articles, he uh, fleshed out a little bit, but not a whole lot because both of us were writers and uh, we had that in common. So it really wasn't uh, that much of an issue. Which book did Mr. Parker ask you to write the forward in? Uh, volume three. Volume three of the Infinite Insights. Okay. Well, guess what, folks? I have a copy of that right here. And I am going to look it up real quick. Boy, it is three pages long, my friend. He said it was the longest one of all of them. And it is. Let's see. Here it is. It's on page. It's right here, boy. It's on uh, in the intro, pre the preface of, um, it looks like page seven. But I'm just going to go to the last paragraph because it reflects Lee Wedlick, who is an amazing individual. And it is really great that we have this chance. But I'm going to read it anyway. If this doesn't inspire you to pick up his books, I don't know what to tell you. Like we can lead you to the water, folks, but if you don't want to drink, you're going to walk away thirsty. Not only is it my privilege to write the preface to this volume, it is my pleasure to, as well, to study under Mr. Parker. From time to time, I have had opportunities to work with other well-known martial artists. On numerous occasions, they have imparted what they have termed new techniques, end quote. To my amazement, I discovered that these same techniques were standard practices in Kempo and the basic ingredients of an all-encompassing system. Although this knowledge was a pleasant surprise, it further strengthens my faith in the man and his system. There's the book. Pick it up. You can get these things. I mean, there's a reason why he's in here. There's a reason why that he did this. It's funny, you're, there's there's a lot of photographs of uh, Frank Trejo in here, and I will bet there's some of you in in one of these books as well. Am I right? Um, there's not oh, one photo. No, I'm in I'm in volume five. I am line drawings in five. Line drawings. So you're the stick man. <laughs> Almost stick, stick it to him, buddy. Yeah. You know how cool is that? So let's move on. <laughs> Continuing on with uh, you know what we've been dealing with right here. And, uh, you know, I read it on Kempo. You, you, you talked about, uh, about Ed Parker, okay? Uh, on the next chapter, it's on, on Kempo, you talk about changes, missing pieces. Missing pieces. Are those secrets that we haven't found out yet? Sort mm -hmm. of like the, the, the Hubble telescope or the, the, whatever it is, the web telescope that is now revealing amazing photographs of the universe way beyond our comprehension, okay? So is that what that is? 
missing pieces, random inaccuracies, points worth repeating. If you didn't get it the first time, I'm going to hit you the second time. Okay? There you go. The Parker salutation and more on salutations. Wow, I'm looking forward to reading those. Yeah, I thought uh, it was interesting. Um, you did many seminars with Mr. Parker. You were also on stage, the uh, center stage with him for yes. demo too, right? Uh, not at the internationals, no. You didn't do that? No. I um, I remember one time uh, Frank showed me how it was where he out of the salutation before he closed, drop into the right neutral, right reverse, rear cross, one leg. And then he would go into the rest of the salutation. Mm -hmm. Only those that either train with him or are present to watch that will know that. For the most of the people, they say, why is, why is he doing that? Yeah. Those are the little, little things that proved something about Ed Parker. How was he on the – how big was the salutations for him? How important was that to him? That was his mark on the system because uh, as he described it to me and as I, I say in the books it showed the old and the new the basic system from you know the Chinese into the what he called the modern day Kempo and that we had elements of both so he fused them into that uniquely Ed Parker salutation. Hmm. Okay because he sometimes you know what it looked like to me sometimes it looked like he was he was fishing. Uh, well he would. Like he would cast you know, that sat over the top, you know. Now, Frank took it to another level, mind well, you. Frank and, and Dennis used to do things. And sometimes, you know, Mr. Parker liked being one of the guys, and he would do the same thing. Really? Uh, yeah, because, you know, I would do something, and then he would do it too. And, and Dennis would do something, and Mr. Parker would do it too. It was fun to to, uh, to do that with him. Wow. Wow. Okay, off the pass on the Sally patients, you also talk about the origin of the cover out here in yep. this book complement forms that'd be interesting speaking of forms and then we're a slap art <laughs> let us let okay i have to ask about that one okay without deep in too deep in it why is it called the slap art well you what know that's one of the trademarks that people pick up on and i tell a story in there about um somebody that wrote a letter to one of the magazines way back when saying, you guys slap yourselves, you slap yourselves more than you slap the other guy. So I thought that was a catchy title. And uh, I, I talk a little bit about why it seems to look like that. And uh, a story about a couple of stories about some black belts from other systems that said, Oh, we really didn't know what we were looking at. Ignorance. That has always been a thing that bothers me. Uh, my father shared it to me, and I learned that when I was in school. There's really three things. There's the people that have the capacity to understand, those that don't have the capacity to understand. So there's a difference between being ignorant and stupid. Yes. If you're stupid, you tell us, they just not have the capacity to understand. Right. Okay? But I guarantee if you talk to your dog, and you say, don't do that again in the house, and you show them why, and they send them out, he ain't going to do that again, okay? Yeah. Yeah. He's not stupid. Nice. He may have been ignorant of being an animal, but he was corrected, okay? Yeah. I think stupid is when you have the ability and you ignore it, and then something bad happens. And I always I like to define that. I, did, I look at stupid sometimes. It's just They just don't have the IQ for it. They, they just don't have the capacity. Ignorant to me is like somebody who doesn't know. Who just Absolutely, is. I agree with you on that. I mean, yeah, they don't know, yeah, but if they, they don't, but if they finally, finally, they do know, and they do don't do it, then they're stupid. Yeah. <laughs> okay, hey, sorry, I'm mean, fine. This is his time, not mine. So, okay, we're in <laughs> chapter five, five on concepts, principles, terminology. You first of all categorize them. Category completion. Wow, that is a hot topic. Yes, it is. That I have heard so many times on these discussions. <laughs> I'm glad you're going to define that and bring it out. And yeah, I'm just, I talk about it. It's like, hey, if you like it, great. But the book's got my thoughts on it. Okay. I didn't have a problem with completion. If we were a complete art, it would be never expansion. 
Uh, that would be the next level. That's part, so? my, that's part of my problem with the def, with that term. Should the term be different then? I think so. Okay. I don't think it should be category completion because when you talk about categories, you talk about itemization, then you talk about completion. It's like all things related. So, and that would include even the bad stuff. And we don't block like this. Yeah. Because it doesn't work very well, but it would complete the category. Outside downward, inside downward, palm up, inside downward, palm down. Well, then you'd have to have an outside downward, palm up to complete the category. Mm -hmm. but you don't because it doesn't work very well, if at all. So the category is not truly complete. So I get the concept of what they're trying to get across. I just think that the term is not very good. Can it not be instead of the category? It, are we re, are using it in the wrong in the wrong context? And I'll I'll answer I'll ask that I'll ask that reason find that question if you want. But is it the wrong context? Well, that's why you know when I talk about uh, terminology and and so on in the book, uh, and a lot of things that Ed Parker did, he he defined something and then like in a dictionary it would say see also, and then there's another definition or another term. So you may have to search around and say, well, you know, category completion may not be, you know, you've got to look through the English language and pick a word that, that fills that for you. Not that it's right or wrong, but did Mr. Parker use that word, category not, completion? I don't remember him saying that, but that doesn't mean he didn't do it. When was the first time you heard him use the word ideal versus the base? That I couldn't tell you because I've been exposed to him so many times. I just. See, I always looked at it as the ideal phase is the end result. I don't want to get hit. So therefore I do whatever it takes. Yeah. Where the base move is like mathematic. I hand you a book, teaches me how to do one plus one is two, two yeah. plus two is four. That's just your base. But well, that's not the way it is. That's a discussion I have in the book is like, you know, what do you like about some of these terms? What do mm -hmm. they actually mean? Okay. I, uh, I also think that the category completion, I would think that should be referred to only a drill set. You did up, you did down, you went out, you went left, right, in, out, whatever. I understand. Okay. It's like anything in exercise. You work certain muscles. Okay. And you do them. It's impossible to do them all, but you can at least try. But it also limits yourself in that. So this could have a bone of contention. I'm going to get there's going to be some feedback on me for this oh, one. Well, there was, uh, I wrote the book like that so people could look at it and go, well, I, you know, I didn't think of that or I thought about that and I don't agree. Okay. I just uh, I put all these things in the book so that a beginner or a black belt who's got a lot of experience can go back and get something out of this. Yeah. Oh, this is great. I, I want I want to, the people here that are listening, you got to look at, we're discussing just the overview here. Yeah, right. it's not we're not giving you anything other than just these are the things if they don't if they don't stimulate your mind as a martial artist you might have to go back and re-examine what you're doing because i think these are really helpful and things he talks about also in this chapter five sources of power the power principles are not isolated yeah wow there you go folks uh don't turn your back on your opponent the obscurity gosh you know i can't tell you how many times People are never looking over their shoulder, and that's why they back their car into some other idiot. Yeah. <laughs> because they're not thinking there's something back there. Right. You know, and, and that is also probably applies. You can use that in your, uh, in the A consideration in your environment and awareness. You have to know, like, where's your exit strategy? Okay. It may be just right behind you, or, you know, there's a famous quote by Bruce Lee he never worried about his back. Well, that, I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah. You need to know where that exit. My Parker said to me one time, he says, hey, you might have to have to go right through the guy in front of you. That's the way out. So anyway, keep on going on this. You have multiple definitions of techniques, names, overlapping terms. Redundancy, is that what you're talking about? Uh, you know, he was a very smart man. And he said, you're going to get it if I say it like this. And he's going to get it if I say it like that. And so sometimes the same idea was was used to, uh, with two terms i see so if i say you know why do we have marriage gravity and gravitational marriage in the lexicon some people will you know one's going to stick with it and the other one's not 
I've heard that both terms, and sometimes I, I am, I, I am guilty. I use either or. And and I do too. It but, doesn't uh, matter. I mean, you're still getting the general premise of what I'm yeah, talking about. Yeah, but the point is, is that you got two different terms for the same thing. And so he did that in a lot of places. I see. Yeah, and, you know, I've heard that from uh, Knesser as well. He would be re a little bit redundant because maybe they didn't understand it. And that principle yeah. might be taught in a very similar technique with a different variation. Right. And then he, and he had those things come up. Uh, speed and power. The motion chart measures of degree or measure of degree. Interesting. The shooting gallery effect. <laughs> a consideration revisit. Yes. Yeah. I swear to God, if you have anything in your life, you need that volume one book. This book is, look at my book. I've had it from day one. This thing is falling apart. I've got tape on it. I've got, I, I mean, things marked. It's insane. And I still keep on going back to it. Yeah. I mean, this, if there's anything, I mean, there's some history in here too, but, um, which is nice because, you know, you should know a little bit about what we're about. But I think the history is right now, the present. Make history now so that in five years you can look back and say, oh, I spent some time with Senior Master Arts Wedlake, and I remember these these lessons here. Right. And then he'll write a book, Lessons with Senior Master of the Arts Lee Wedlake. You know? <laughs> I'm serious. You know, maybe, people do take maybe. what you do serious. Uh, the Helping Hands Checking, Master Keys. God, that's another one. That yeah, master yeah. keys thing. I, uh, you know, we've talked about this sort of thing before, and everybody's got their take on it. So that's just my thinking on the master key. Uh, it's like if somebody reads that and says, "Yeah, I agree," or if they don't, okay, okay. No, you know what though? You don't. Here's the problem: it's been so evasive or elusive. It's it's like ooh, it's like. Well, that's. I wanted to try to clarify it a little bit you know, with what I wrote. But you don't find a lot of documentation, except from the encyclopedia. Yeah. That came out after Mr. Parker's death, and those are personal notes. So right. how they were structured? Are those actually his, or are they just taken and put together in an organized manner? Yeah. That's and what's the reason for it? What was the intent? So I'm not going to go down that path, but I want to make sure people understand. You have family groupings. That's one of the great ones. If you don't know that stuff, you better get back in here and sit down and say, Mr. Wedlake, please explain family groupings. Yeah. And uh, and what that's about. So these are, what he's touched upon here is essential things for your temple journey. If you don't know this stuff, or you're not familiar with this stuff, you're spending too much time in, in the Kempo McDonald's. All right? That I'm could sorry. be. You know, and I want somebody to look at it and say, well, I don't know much about this. I need to ask someone and present those questions. And that instructor, if they're not familiar with it, should be able to say, I don't know, but I know where to find out. Paul up Lee Wedley. Yeah. Or Paul Casey. Or no, Dennis don't tell him to call Lee Wedley. <laughs> or say, buy Lee Wedley's book. Yeah, buy the book. I, I, in these conversations, I always try to stay neutral. It is really not my position, though I've gained so much from talking to people like yourself. It is really a perfect moment in Campbell to spend time talking to you, Lee, because, boy, you have you. such knowledge. There's even other seniors that will say to me, I defer to him, if you really oh, want really? to know. Yeah. yeah, and it's important that you hear that, because I've had some people, and I'll leave them nameless, don't ask me about the books or don't ask me about those questions. And it really disturbs me because I think you're doing a disservice to yourself and more importantly to the future generations. Yeah. Because if you think about it, every five years, a new generation comes in, I would think, in our system. Mm -hmm. You know, you're four years, you get into be a black belt and then new ones come in. So since Ed Parker's passing, that's 30 years. Well, that's six generations. Am I wrong? All right. You know, six generations. And where are we at with that? We, right. I think we've, you know, regressed on that from that. So let's go on. Uh, what about opposing forces? What about borrow forces? Great uh, discussions. I mean, really, I've talked to that over numerous times to other people, and they they're like Todd Durgan is really strong in this kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah, and so is Ron Chappelle, 
and and then canaster will talk your ear off you know if you don't watch out on that stuff and then you know obviously you have counter rotation torque wow who talks about that hello out there i'm well, talking i to hope you. they talk about it they don't <laughs> I'm sorry. I know you're, you know, you're, you know, you're like going, wow, but uh, they don't. I, there's, like I said, it's just like, teach me how to do a, a technique. And at the end, if you're with certain people, you look like they do the technique and then they'll freeze up and hold a pose. And man, you should be relaxed. The whole thing. You should be, yeah. they got it, got through that, not tensing up. You know, it's against the look. Anyway, martial art, chapter six. I'm glossing on these a little bit. On Marshall's, uh, the Marshall thinking. Is it really now the Marshall thinking or is it Marshall science? I've heard both. No, oh, Marshall thinking. Okay. Yeah. Why? Why is it called Marshall thinking, sir? Marshall thinking is the, the term that I use to describe, you know, it's the overarching term of the uh, readings that you have from the martial artists over the years. Like I mentioned Sun Tzu in there and uh, Misashi and so on. That's Marshall thinking. And uh, I think the science part comes down to the nuts and bolts of how to do it. Uh, so, I mean, you're going to have to tie that mental part in there. But I, th I think there's a, uh, when I use that title was to get them to think about these other aspects in there. So when you read the examples of, of what uh, are in that chapter, you get a better picture. Yeah, he actually, is one of the, the best things you have, and I have a friend of mine that holds uh, 52 uh, martial uh, um, uh, masters, and Chris does a whole thing on that where he spends, as you say, right off the bat, some time with Miyamoto, okay? Yeah. Well, you need to spend one of the greatest, if not the greatest, Japanese swordsman ever, and how he, but what was his greatness, and, and, and this you can get out of his own book. What is your what is your impression, Lee, on Miyamoto Musashi's uh, the the Book of Five Rings? Well, wow, that's you know there's a whole book on that. It's not a very big book, but it's got a lot of information in there. Uh, he talks about the mental aspects of it, as well as um, the psychology of of fighting and warfare that I think people need to be aware of because a lot of people don't understand that aspect of it is that this gets down to where the rubber meets the road and it's conflict, it's conflict management. You know, sometimes we're called managers of violence when we do these sort of things because you have to handle it and you've got to have a, a martial mentality to do that where some people are, you know, they're dilettantes. They're just doing all this because it's fun to do and it's a way to get in shape and meet people and socialize and, and so on, but it's not really a martial attitude. Would you say then uh, Miyamoto in a synopsis of it is that his focus is the mindset of the warrior. So therefore, when he goes into battle, that is one less thing he has to worry about. Now it's just execution. Yeah. 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 Sum, sum it up a little bit. Yeah. You got to practice, you know, like the, they like to say, you got to sweat in practice you don't bleed in battle i like his, his term he says you practice as if you would in battle yeah. you go, that, that's it same thing i mean you said sweat but it said because he who sits there and just walks through the motions is going to get his ass handed to him yeah and and that happened to me one of the first times i fought when i first met frank Trejo. mindset wasn't there therefore i got my ass walked and I never forgot that. I yeah. still love you, Casey. There's a friend of mine, Casey Jones, is who I fought. <laughs> and he, and, I, and, he, and it was, it, he's a great guy. But then he came from a mindset of a fighting system, strictly yeah. fighting. Forget everything else. It was, he was already ready to go to bat here. And I learned that from him from that day. And then after that, when I went with Frank and I started fighting tournaments and I started winning in tournaments, and he said, ah, Pablo, do this. Pablo, do that. So how you doing? You know, just like, get me all. Yeah. Until I started to find out, I didn't like the idea of fighting somebody for a for a trophy, for a point. And they give you, oh, there's a point. I said, that was going to hurt me. But they, whatever. And then they start right. stripping tournaments when they take away the sweeps. 
right. have a problem with that. That's a Trejo signature. You do yeah. not. And you saw that in Kelly. You saw that with Ed Parker. I know you know that. Oh, yeah. Body slam that person. Okay, moving along. Here we go. Uh, you have it, Sun Tzu, The Art of War. That's probably the greatest treatises on strategy ever. Yeah. And it's taught in business as well. How much of that do you reflect on it? Or is just a, just a, just a, it's, it's a, it's a signpost. You know, people need to read Sun Tzu. They need to read Musashi. They need to read Clausewitz and so on. And they should be familiar with some of the great generals in, in, in the last century. So, uh, cause you know, this is martial art and that all applies. We go with the last couple of things on martial thinking is that you go into problem solving the context of self-defense, self-evident. Yeah. Once you get in the chapter, it'll probably uh, will help you to, to understand that better. Thoughts on Ed Parker's language analogy. And I'm not sure if this, after that, you have a distinction without a difference. Yeah. What a cool topic. A distinction without a difference. That sounds like you're talking out of... Now you've got to read the chapter in there because sometimes people come up with terminology and so on and they go, well, they're making a distinction between this and that, but it doesn't make any difference. Is it the next one called extreme fear self a dichotomy? Look at that. Think about that. Extreme fear. Isn't fear extreme for the mindset anyway? I'm like, oh my God. I'm no. So no, because you've got degrees of it like anything else, but extreme fear is the name of the book. That, uh, that's another one that I think people should read. Okay. I'm moving along right in here now. We're in, I'm into chapter seven. On Obviously, these are going to go with, on targets and weapons. You talked about specialized moves, the blocking punch, thumbs. I never hear anybody talking about thumbs unless they're eye pokes. That's it, you know, and you see that only in some of the forms. But remember, keep your fingers together, folks, when you do your forms. That's right. <laughs> I remember that, Lee. Boy, oh, boy, I'm not getting knocked down by you for not having my fingers together. That's for sure. <laughs> you know, attacking the knee. Wow. Eye hooks and pokes. The back knuckle claw series. That's interesting. The Kempo chop. Using the heel palm. A humiliating kick. In the crotch, I would think <laughs> anything kicking to the groin is is going to be humiliating. I'll yeah. say, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a it's a lyric in a Sting uh, song. It is. Oh, so you're referencing an entertainer here. Yeah. I'll see how that works. Yeah. Uh, scoop kicks, stomp kicks, introduction of natural weapons. Thoughts on technique analysis. Natural weapons. Is there such a misunderstanding as to that? The difference between a natural weapon and a natural uh, defense. Yeah, you know, we refer to natural weapons as how you form your weapons. Okay. Okay. And then you apply them in defense or offense. So you've broken them down a little bit more than in the eight considerations is what you're right. saying. Okay. I think that's really important when you look at it, defenses versus weapons. Obviously, for those that don't know, I'm not going to tell you. Sorry. Ain't going to happen. I'm not giving anything away here. Chapter eight on the aspects of self-defense. You have force, progression, and verbal judo. So is that a way of de-escalating the situation? Yes, is that what you're doing? Using your mind to, to address that? Once again, it's a signpost to uh, where you should be thinking about uh, digging up more information on de-escalating. You know, because, you know, that's the, one of the reasons that there is a tiger and a dragon in the patch, right? Is that you got those tigers down here? It's like, yeah, I think I'm going to hook them up. And then the dragon's like, no, nah, I think we can talk them out of it. Is that, can you attribute that to uh, your law enforcement background? Uh, well, it, it's a big, uh, it's a big key you know, with de escalation, uh, particularly anymore these days. But uh, yes, I would say that's one of the triggers. I would say it, 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 this is really sad, folks. When you think of law enforcement, you think, ah, oh, they're just that's the troops coming in to solve the problem. If you don't do what they're gonna do, they're gonna kick that person's butt or shoot them or whatever. Actually, in today's mindset, police are being uh, sort of handcuffed 
that they cannot use force. Everything has to be a compliant type of yeah. response. You make them comply with you. You use stuff that may get the law enforcement officer injured. Yeah. Where he would normally just say, hey, if the guy comes at me, he's going to try to beat me up. I mean, what you see all the time, you got to use some kind of neutralizing type of response. Grab, right. uh, you know, pin check, choke. My God, they took away the stick. You can't even use the baton anymore because yeah. people are dying from that. And if you beat the person with the stick, you're all sudden excessive force. Heaven yeah. forbid you pull out the gun and shoot him. And it's you all know? on video. Yeah, it's, and that's it. They, it they, it's, it's making yeah. it where we're not, it's not working for us. I'm sorry about that. Um, we're looking at other things in here. You have a knife in the other hand, backup weapons. So are you addressing the use of, of, of knives? No. No, what I'm saying is if you picture a knife being in the other hand, because a lot of people look at the attack and go, well, that's the attack. It's like, well, if a guy has a knife in this hand when he's doing long kimono, this is the real threat. So it's I, I was in Long Beach uh, back in August, and I revisited um, the original Vagabond 32 years Oh, you told me the story, yeah. And, and I'm going to tell you, it was flashing. I was flashing. I was in the same room as Ed Parker yep. with my son. And But later that night after that, we went down to have pizza. And if I told you this, I saw a street altercation with one of the homeless guys. Yes, you there. did. You told me all about And he it. had the knife. And my son's eyes just went, ah, daddy. And yeah. we were inside a glass situation. And he had that knife in on his hip right yeah. there. And doing this business, or it was like this, folks. Picture that in my hip and the hand going like this, hiding it here. And the other gentleman uh, took the Coke and threw it in his face and then ran and they chased each other. Yeah. You know, that is such a good point. Uh, you know, awareness, environment, range. And then you got the rest of them. And then you think about it. If you perceive, or you think in your head, this scenario you'll be a little bit more prepared. In other words, right. common sense tells me don't go buy insurance after the accident. Right. It's not going to do you any good. Right. Okay, so we're moving on here. Uh, you have obviously a normalcy bias. I'm not sure what that means. No, read the book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Defending the third person, scanning. Obviously, this is all in your environment in the eight considerations. Slip and catch. The value of technique extensions. Is that really important? Don't we actually have those extensions? Well, we, we do, but people emotional. say, well, we don't need them because you're not going to do all those moves. But it's like, there's a whole lot of interesting information in those Never extensions. a perfect scenario. No. Right. And that's what's scary. You come up on them. You're trying to use diplomacy. You're trying all of a sudden it gets out of hand. He's psycho. He goes off on you. And then one of his buddies jumps into the fracas. Now you're fighting two. And the third guy comes up with the stick or the knife and starts to cut you. I mean, this starts, things start to get really hairy. On that yeah. Kind of stuff. Yeah. So you need to be able to have an understanding. Stand up jujitsu. Cool. Isn't that what we do, though? Yes. Yeah, let people on the panel just let me know. Then they know. I think that a nice discussion, which I like to have with you sometimes, is the segue between vertical and horizontal responses and attacks and yeah. i think the biggest problem i have is the segue from vertical to the horizontal yeah we can and, talk about it yeah I, I i i'll be honest with you ali i remember mr parker said for me you don't want to be on the ground if you don't can't be on the ground if you get on the ground get the hell off the ground as quickly as you can yeah. and there's a man that knew judo so whatever anyway so we're moving on uh club of defenses multiple attackers i mean this is the this is a shopping list of Kempo Karate, and it's been articulated and isolated and gets you to think. And most people aren't even thinking of this stuff. Right. And boy, oh boy, my friends, that those Chinese characters behind me, that means something. The spirit of the law of the fist. Okay, we got it here. Okay, so we're going on. Freestyle techniques obviously speak on itself. And now we're into chapter 10 on physical and mental workings. Wow, I guess imp impairment would be one. I mean, are you been drinking? Are you going to sleep? Yeah. You know, 
you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that people don't realize. Don't put yourself actually in the situation. That's probably one of the best things. Right. You can avoid it. Stay home. Get enough rest. Eat the right food. You take care of yourself. There's no question. You also do other things, which I would like to suggest. Um, uh, Mr. Wedlake has uh, on his, uh, he has a special channel, video channel that you can subscribe to. Right. And I think, what did you say? There's 1,600 videos on there? Yeah, between the two of them. Yeah, and if you think about it, he also covers other aspects. One of them is Tai Chi. Am I right? A little bit of Tai Chi in there, yeah. And also the and the benefits and and the strengths of studying it. Most people just think it's just a relaxing thing to do for old people in the park. Yeah. Okay, they don't realize that Tai Chi is actually a combative system. That's right. Tomorrow. See, go and pick up the video. Listen to what the guy has to say. You'll be better off for it, and you'll have a better appreciation. It's like going to Las Vegas. If you hang out at the slot machines, you're going to miss everything. All right? right? Especially if you're hungry. Just play one more time shh, and lose more money. Go into the buffet. <laughs> and in the buffet, which we have great buffet, is sort of like studying with Lee Wedley. He's going to present this entire spectrum of, of different cuisines there. And you can pick and choose a little bit and then maybe be, you know, exposed to a whole new mindset. And that's what this book is going to do. I'm just reading the outline. I'm hoping, yep. You know, well, there's no doubt. This is available on Amazon. So let's get down to the last thing. So you have the eyes have it. Okay. You have functional blindness. Wow. The eyes have it to functional blindness. Yeah. Put the blinders on. And you got bad things will happen. You have breathing. Dennis and I have had this conversation. You know, most people don't even focus on that. Right. Breathing. Why? Is it not important to them? I, I think they take it for granted because you, know, you breathe in, you breathe out. Now, like, what else is there to know? <laughs> well, when the, when it's knocked out of you, you're going to be thinking about it, I, I guarantee. They do. And usually people just tell them to relax and breathe. Well, that doesn't always work. I think, you know, it's funny, there's a, there's a, a term that's used and it's in the Tao Te Ching, okay, Lao Tzu has, about the use of water, which was borrowed by uh, Bruce Lee. Be water, my friend. Well, I would rather say be oxygen, my friend. You can live days without water. It's oxygen is breathe. in the water. Yeah. You can't breathe. You can't live. You'll be dead in moments. No, it's the military's okay. rule of three. Yeah. Three minutes without oxygen, three days without uh, water. And, three weeks. And, and see, so therefore, don't let somebody knock the wind out of you or cut, hit your throat, your solar plex, whatever it's going to take. Yeah. Because yeah. once you're down, you don't, you expire. Okay. And oxygen, the beautiful thing about oxygen is that when it is, you can see it's there. You notice its effect. You don't really see it. You just see the effect of what it does. Right. It blows the trees. It moves the sand. It gives you that, that gentle feeling over it. If it's horrific, it destroys. Yeah. And that's more powerful than the water because the oxygen is everywhere. Okay, go. we're going to, let's wrap it up here. So I'm going to get to the last chapter and it's about on accepting the tent. Just briefly, I think uh, you want to say something about that real quick? Well, I said it in the book, but uh, I described the mechanics and dynamics of how this all came together and uh, tried to give people an insight into how I looked at the whole thing. And I had uh, Bob White and John Spolvita read it before I put it in print so that I didn't, you know, I wanted to make sure my memory was correct and so on, and they agreed, so I decided to print that. You know what? You are what Mr. Parker um, wrote in the Zen of Kempo. And I'm going to close with this. Truly, you represent it. A true measure of humility is when you remain what you are, regardless of the success that you have become. Yeah. Uh, senior uh, Master of the Arts, Wedlake, you truly are a, 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 a genuine asset. And Mr. Parker, I know, is smiling knowing that you are furthering this and growing this. And I am honored to call you my friend, or at least I want to be your friend. Oh, I've known you a long time. We've been friends you're for a long time, person. Paul. Yeah, you're a good person. <laughs> and I think anybody that's out there, please reach out to Mr. Wedlake. 
Uh, if you want his books, go to Amazon. The new one is available and and also his website. So tell us the name of the book one more time and your website. There, Lee, before it's you go. The, uh, Lee Wedlake's Kempo Companion. And the website, uh, you can go to uh, Kempo TV for my basic website. There's no videos on it, but there's some other information. And for the videos, you go to Vimeo, Lee Wedlake at Vimeo. With no further ado, friends, I am so grateful to have Senior Master of Arts Lee Wedlake on here. Lee, thank you. I wish you the very best. I'm looking forward to having a lot of people get very excited about this. And I know that this is a great asset. And, and it would be a wonderful addition to your knowledge, especially the book, because it lays it out there. And then please attend one of his seminars or reach out to him. You will be better off from it. Thank you so much, Lee. Thanks, Paul. Salute, my friend. God Take bless care. you. Bye. Paul Casey, Kempo Karate Hall of Fame.